What is strategic leadership? Broadly defined, strategic leadership could be said to be a management approach that involves the development and implementation of strategies that drive an organization towards its goals and objectives. In the contemporary world, strategic leadership has become increasingly important due to the complex and dynamic nature of the business environment. Strategic leadership in this context would include vision setting, anticipating future trends, creating a culture of innovation and collaboration, seeing opportunities and participating and also anticipating risks, making sound decisions, engendering a culture of personal and corporate responsibility for outcomes. And last but not the least, empowering people to take initiative and make decisions. To be an effective strategic leader, you must be able to think critically, make decisions based on data, and communicate your vision effectively and lead decisively. I would like to share some of my experiences that will maybe provide you with some context into this. In the 1980s and 90s, for example, I'm trying to give maybe a bit of maybe my experience in the business world, especially here in Nigeria. In the 80s and 90s, Nigeria was importing almost everything we were consuming in terms of food. We were importing sugar, flour, rice, edible oils, and what have you. And sugar was probably the item that Nigeria was importing the most. Of course, there was rice. And at that time, there were maybe about five or six companies in Nigeria that were the major importers of these commodities. And even though I was a young kid at the time, if I may, I happened to be one of those few that were actually in the business of importing uh, food items. The market was very, very competitive at the time. And most of the companies that were importing these commodities, you know, were always competing with each other. And the margins were very, very thin. Because at that time, you know, everybody wanted to import. So one of the companies at the time decided that maybe it would be a good idea to find a way in which he would be able to manage to have a monopoly of the business. And they were able to come up with an idea that is to set up a sugar refinery in Lagos. And in building that sugar refinery, they applied and got a concession at, the, uh, at one of the ports in Apapa at the time, and they set up a sugar refinery. But in doing so, they sought and actually got a concession from the government that if you import raw sugar and add value, you'll be able to enjoy a tax you know, uh, concession, meaning that you are adding value, so you'll be able to have some sort of uh, tax waiver. So suddenly, there was this company setting up a sugar refinery, and the refinery at that time was like 50% of what actually the demand was for in Nigeria. And they were given that tax, tax waiver. So everybody importing refined sugar had to pay 70% duty. Meanwhile, this company that is now with the sugar refinery in, in Lagos uh, was only uh, paying 10%. So we woke up one day and nobody could import sugar into Nigeria but that company. So it was like magic in the sense that everybody was trying to bring in sugar, but if you bring in the sugar, you have to pay 50% 
duty, uh, 20% duty and 50% levy. So many 70%. Meanwhile, if you have a factory, you, can, you are allowed only 30%. So the price of sugar in Nigeria suddenly went up, but then 50% of the market was going to one company. And not only that, because the demand was so high, because he was only able to um, you know, cater for 50% of the demand, you know, and then suddenly he now decided to actually uh, expand the business. And in no time, he expanded that business and he was getting almost 80% of the entire market. So I sat down and started thinking, we can't just let this go like that. We've been in this business for many, many years and we have to find a way. At the time, you know, this was in the 90s. Money was quite challenging to be able to get even a facility from the banks because Nigerian banks at that time, you know, were not as liquid as they are today. So it would not have been possible to actually borrow the kind of money needed to set up a refinery, which at the time was about $200 million. So I said, look, there is no way that we are going to leave this business. I now decided that I wanted to also set up a sugar refinery in Lagos. So we started looking for a site, because for you to be able to have a sugar refinery, it must be a port based meaning that it must be within a terminal, within a port, because you are importing the raw sugar in bulk, not in bags. And for you to be able to bring in the sugar in bulk, you need to have your own terminal. And the site, the factory, the plant must be sited within the terminal for ease of one, you know, uh, discharging, evacuation, and then production. And at that time, you know, it was very difficult to get uh, port concession. So we approached a company in Lagos that had a concession which is had since the military, you know, years in the 70s and 60s and agreed for him to lease half of his terminal for us to set up um, our sugar refinery. We agreed, signed a lease agreement with him paid him for two years and agreed to be paying five dollars per ton of every sugar that we imported, raw sugar we imported into Nigeria. Unknown to us, this competitor was watching. So he waited until we got, you know, all the equipment in Nigeria, started, you know, construction, actually piling at the time, just like soil, you know, improvement. And then I was coming to my office one morning in uh, Papa and I saw the port manager waiting for me at 8.30 in the morning. Immediately I knew there was something wrong. He said, sir, we have a problem. I said, hmm, what do we have now? He said, the land that you are going to build your sugar refinery has been revoked. I said, revoked? He said, yes. He said, that is, you know, that you cannot even do anything there. That is number one. And he said, secondly, the site has been allocated to your competitor. <laughs> I said, which of them? He said, the one that has a sugar refinery. I said, okay. And at the time, we had spent so much money, imported a lot of equipment, contracted a company in Lagos for the construction, you know, the civil construction of the plant. So you can imagine the way I felt that time. So I sat down and I said, okay. What do we do now? I started looking around. Luckily for us, you know, um, there was a land that we initially were considering that belonged to my father. And then I approached him. He had a big old house on it, outside the port, not, you know, but just about maybe a kilometer or so away from the port. And he already had of the problem, but I did not tell him, and he did not discuss with me. I just approached him, I said, I will need this land. He said, I know why. I've already had, even though you've not told me. I had of the problem, so go and take the land. We took the land, but then it was much smaller than what we needed. Because already we had designed, we had bought equipment based on the original site. So, the takeaway in this is that one, in the face of challenges, leaders must always be strategic enough to go on to change course, be 
innovative, fast, and in order to in order not to be silent and what's what to do. So we did it and within a year or so we recouped all our investment that should have come in. So if we had at that time decided okay we are, we are going to give up and we don't continue to have a different story today. So that is why I'm saying that leaders must always think through things, you know, face challenges and find uh, solutions always. I mean, there are so many other uh, experiences that I can share with you, but I will maybe go to that a bit later. You know, the same should I finally and other businesses like Senate and what have you. But the principles of strategic leadership is always to have a vision and a mission. To become a strategic leader, you must develop the ability to focus on creating a compelling vision and mission for your organization, which will guide decision making and help align everyone towards a common goal. My first teacher was my father, and I learned by watching him, asking questions, and understanding the why. What drove him to do what he did? What was his purpose? How did that factor into how he ran his various businesses and successes? The answer to these and many more aligned my thinking and helped shed me when I started out. So, what is it that you want to do when you are doing business, when you start your business as a leader? One, you must have a vision. Not only a vision, but you must also enjoy what you do. Whatever you do, make sure you enjoy doing it, because that is very important. If you are not happy doing what you are doing, if you are not happy in your job, if you are not happy you know, in any business you are in, then it's a problem, because you must enjoy doing what you do. And thirdly, add them value. Whatever you do, ensure that you are adding value. B. Flexibility and adaptability. Never stay static and understand your local environment. Strategic leaders need to be flexible and adaptable in response to changes in the market, technology, policies, and other factors that impact the organization. They should have a mindset of continuous learning and be willing to pivot their, strate their strategies based on data and trends or changes in government policy or business environment. I'll tell you another story again. A key example of this principle can be seen in our decision to set up our second sugar refinery in Patakot. You remember the challenges that we went through when we set up our sugar refinery. But because at the time, the monopoly was, that was more or less like a monopoly before we even came in. So it was like, there was a clear 70% margin in the business before we even start, which is the duty advantage that you as a refiner, a refiner has versus those that will be importing back sugar. For example, if you have a a factory, a refinery, you process the sugar. It would maybe cost you between $50 to $70 per ton to refine. But the difference in terms of white sugar and raw sugar is over a hundred, was at the time over $120. It's still over $100 today. So there alone, you are making almost 20 25% margin. And then coming into Nigeria, you pay 10% duty while others pay 70% duty. That 70% duty is already factored into the local price. So that is why I'm saying, you know, with that alone, you have a 60% margin. So the cost of sugar, for example, say, if your cost is 2,000 Naira, you are selling it at 4,000 Naira because of the differential in terms of refining costs and also the duty advantage. So the first tier, as I said, we recouped all our, I think about 16 months, we recouped all our investment, over $150 million that we used to set up the plan. 
And I was like, I wash with so much cash. And at that time, because of the experience that we had, when we wanted to have the sugar refinery in Lagos, where we could not use a terminal at the port, I immediately then understood the importance and the strategic nature of having your own terminal in a port. So immediately, we started looking to actually acquire our own port because our competitor already had a terminal, had a port in Apapa, and we did not. So luckily for us, there was uh, a concession that was taking place to uh, privatize most of the ports in Nigeria and immediately took a position and were able to acquire Potakot port, which we still have, Boa ports and terminals, what that is called in, in Potakot. So when we were able to make so much money at the time from our first sugar refinery in Lagos, I was, okay, we must build another sugar refinery, which we now used the money we were making from the first sugar refinery to set up another refinery in Patakot. So we started the construction of the Patakot sugar refinery. We had gone very far, and this, uh, this time around we ensured that you know the design was robust in case something maybe <laughs> you know uh, was to happen. Anyway, something did happen in Patakot. When we started the sugar refinery, the same competitor now decided there is no way we we'll allow the sugar refinery in Patakot to operate. So they came up with another idea, went to the government and was like, look, anybody building a sugar refinery in Nigeria must have a sugar plantation, <laughs> must be seen to be doing a BIP, which is backward integration program, which is, you know, nothing wrong with it, but that you cannot operate more than one refinery in Nigeria. <laughs> and this is, I mean, it actually happened, it's the truth. So we're halfway, you know, completing the project when we are now called by the Minister of Trade that guys will not be allowed to operate because only one company can have, uh, only a company can have one refinery. Therefore, you already have one in Lagos, you can have a sugar, another sugar refinery in Patakot. I said, how? I said, why is the new policy? BIP. Therefore, the Patakot sugar refinery cannot operate. And not only that, we are now going to be giving allocations to import raw sugar. I said, government is going to be, that means, you know, say, ah, because we want to do this BIP, we want to ensure the backward integration program is working. Therefore, anybody importing sugar, must be given allocation by the government before you can import your raw sugar as raw material. Meaning that government um, will now decide who brings what. I said, okay, go ahead. So then the first allocation came. Competitor got 70%, we got 20. Remaining 10, they said, but they said, you know, they should keep, keep it as a buffer in case there is shortage. So we continued like that. Meanwhile, I had to abandon Port Harcourt because I saw clearly that there would not have been any way we could operate Port Harcourt without getting allocation from the government because it was so much money, you know, to continue to complete it. But after some time, I now started thinking, you know, like four, five years ago, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement was being muted and that I looked at the entire region, that is uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And at the time, you know, this was five years ago, and at that time, there were many refineries anywhere, apart from Nigeria. Nigeria was and is still probably the only country in sub-Saharan Africa that has sugar refineries. Most of the countries, most of the other countries are either using their plantations to produce you know, what we call plantation wide, which the quality is maybe between 150 to 200 Yukumsa sugar, which is not really a, a good quality. But most of the countries are actually importing sugar, if you look at the entire corridor. So, so I was like, okay, there is an opportunity here. 
We have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Let us try and complete the sugar refinery, use it as a destination refinery, which is a model that they have in India, in Egypt, and also in Dubai. These are the only three countries that have sugar, a destination sugar refinery. Let me explain what destination refineries are. Destination refineries are refineries that you go and build in a free trade zone, import your raw sugar, process, and export to other countries. Which means you come, you process, you add value, but you do not pay any duty. But you must export. But in the process, you create jobs, employment, and people get jobs within the country where the refinery or refineries are cited. So Nigeria has that policy in place. So I knew at the time that the policy was there. So we looked at it, but for you to be able to do that, you must have a free trade zone, meaning that my sugar refinery or my potafort has to be designated as a free trade zone. So I knew if I made in any noise that Boa is applying for this, it would die. So I changed the name from Boa to Bundu. <laughs> I now applied as Bundu Free Zone. So everybody was saying, Bundu, who is Bundu? Okay, okay. In no time, I got approval. <laughs> you know? So my terminal was given the go ahead to operate as a free trade zone. I had my sugar refinery there. Immediately, I got the approval. I knew I was good. <laughs> so we completed it. We started. Today, our Pataku Sugar Refinery is exporting sugar to Niger Republic, to Ghana, to Senegal, to Benin, and to Mali today. And we are, in fact, last year, we, we supplied over 80% of the sugar imported to Senegal from Port Harcourt. We went ahead and acquired two vessels, you know, for the transportation, I mean, voyage of uh, sugar from Port Harcourt to, to all these countries. So it has proven to be a very, very good decision. Everybody saw that, and it was going so well. Again, competitor was not happy. He now, I'm sure maybe some of you must have seen the back and forth in the newspapers last year or two years ago. And the managing director of MPA at the time was a very good friend of the competitor. So they sat down, how do we stop Patakot sugar? The only way we can stop it is to revoke, <laughs> to revoke the, the license or the concession. So they went, they looked at it, found one small excuse, and they said, oh, we, you have a problem at this time, and therefore, we have revoked, we have decommissioned the port, and we are going to arbitration. There was an agreement in place that clearly, and the agreement is still there, it's still valid, clearly states, there's no problem in having a dispute. You can have a dispute, you can have issues. You discuss. Try and resolve them amicably. In the event that you are not able to resolve those issues amicably, you go to arbitration. However, whilst the arbitration is ongoing, operation must continue. Very, very clear. No, 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 you cannot continue. We have the commission, you cannot operate for six months. We went to court, got court orders and all of that. Nobody was ready to listen. Luckily for me, and I want to use this opportunity to thank Mr. President for his leadership, for his support, and for his courage. I wrote a letter to Mr. President, explained everything. And Mr. President said, we are not a lawless country. Look at the agreement, tell me. He was advised that what is being done is illegal. MB has no power to decommission the port, has no power to cancel the concession, has no power to even go to arbitration in London. Therefore, he directed the port should be opened, 
immediately. The Boa operations should continue immediately and the revocation should be withdrawn. I'm just, you know, the reason why I'm saying this is so important because people need to understand the challenges that we go through all the time in, in, uh, in doing business. You know, so at the end of the day, we were able to, to, to continue with our business. Our terminal is still operational and uh, we're happy because now, in fact, what we have seen is that the business we are actually doing in Patakot is even more than what we are doing in Lagos. Because if you look at the sub-Saharan Africa, the demand for sugar is in, the, is in excess of over three, three and a half million tons per annum. 80% of that sugar is being imported from either Brazil or India. And if you look at the proximity from, say, Portaco to Dakar, Portaco to Ghana, Accra, Portaco to, you know, all these countries that we are supplying sugar to, for them to import sugar from Brazil or from India, it would cost them additional 50 to $70 per ton, which they are saving because the sugar is coming from Nigeria, one. Number two, they are getting 100, and they import 150 ukumsa. We are producing 45 ukumsa in Nigeria, which means the quality is much better, and they get a better price. And of course, also, with the AFC, ACFTA, which is the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement, they also you know, uh, get some sort of a concession, because there is this agreement between all the member countries that if you are a member of the you know, African continental free trade area, you enjoy this concession. So at the end of the day, it's a win-win. They get cheaper, better sugar, we sell our sugar because we are able to produce cheaper than India and Brazil. And then they save the high freight that the ordinary would have to pay if they import from India and or uh, Brazil. So that is why sometimes you really have to think through, of course, there are issues sometimes that could be beyond one's control, like if not, maybe for example, one was able to, you know, uh, have, you know, be able to get His Excellency to intervene in this matter, maybe it would have been a different story today. So that is on, on sugar. Another experience which, <laughs> again, I, I know I keep mentioning the same competitor, but to be honest, you know, these are, these are cases that happened. And you know, I'm sure some of you probably must have heard. In 1999, you know, just before Mr. Uh, President Obasanjo came into power, Nigeria was importing, I'm talking about cement now. I want to talk about cement, okay? Nigeria was importing maybe 90% of what we were consuming in terms of cement at the time there were maybe two or three factories and you know in nigeria all of them owned by uh, foreign companies you know at the time lafarge and uh, blue circle that although they sold to another uh, european company and then over and he said okay how do we in 2000 how do we address this issue why is it that we are importing everything that we you know, all this men that we consume. And it is well known that Nigeria is sitting on billions of tons of limestone, even as a tech. And it was like, what can we do? I mean, he was trying to be patriotic, you know, he wanted Nigeria to be able to be self-sufficient, not only on, in cement, but, you know, other products as well. So, of course, you know, everybody was like, okay, what do we do, what do we do? So he decided that he wanted companies, local companies, to come and see how they can support and set up uh, cement factories in Nigeria so that we stop importing cement. And then Mr. President was sold the idea that, oh, uh, it is true, sir, but we should not make it open. You know, allow importation only to those that will be uh, setting up plants. And of course, the companies that were allowed to set up plants was discussed and agreed at the presidency. So there are only three companies that were given the go-ahead, okay, go and set up cement plants. But in the process, they came up with another policy. Nobody could import cement but those that would set up cement plants in Nigeria. 
So at the end of the day, another monopoly was created for cement importation into Nigeria. The same competitor was quite ahead. He was the first one to be given license. And then they made it, you know, uh, you know as an uh, under license. So you must have a license before you could import cement. So it continued. And then in 2003, it took about two, three years because they could not continue importing in bags. So it had to be in bulk, meaning that for you to import cement in bulk, you must have a terminal where you bag the cement and all of that. So it took two to three years to be able to. So once those terminals were ready, they now banned the importation of cement only to those that were seen to be building plants. It's not like the plants were built, no. Just to be seen. That means you have a land, and then you have applied your building, or you write you are building a cement plant. But that you must be, you must be given a license. Therefore, if you come and say, oh, I want to build a cement plant, this is my land. Okay, wait, we are not ready to give you license yet. So again, monopoly. Okay, that continued for, you know, seven years. President Yaradua now came. And he looked at the situation. Nigeria, the cement price in Nigeria at that time was almost $500 per ton. Almost the highest anywhere in the world. Everybody was crying because there wasn't enough cement because only three companies were allowed to be importing cement at the time. Then President Eradua came, there were a lot of complaints and he said, you know what, guys, enough is enough. This has to stop. What do we do? Then he set up a committee, they sat down, they agreed, okay. The only way for now, sir, is to allow others to come in and import, to break this monopoly. How do we do it? He said, okay, fine, no problem. Let's try and see those that have the capacity to set up these plants in Nigeria and give them licenses. So they decided that you give, you know, they should get one company each from each of the zones, six zones, you know, uh, uh, zones in Nigeria, regions in Nigeria. Six companies were now advanced to Mr. President. And we happen to be one of those companies from the northwestern part of the country. Because Dan Gotti, I'll mention his name now, was already importing. <laughs> so they could not have given to lessons to Dan Gotti again. So they gave to Boa. And Mr. President said, you know, we must be able to support anybody that wants, that can come and support us. So I now looked at it. One, for you to be able to set up a terminal, it will take you two to three years. Mr. President wanted immediate action to be able to. So the only way we could do it was again to be innovative. So I went to London, I sat down with you know, some consultants. Guys, we need to start importing cement into Nigeria. How do we do it? There was no way at the time we could have done it importing bags because it would have been cumbersome. Then we were talking maybe 150, 200,000 tons every month. So for you to be able to do 200,000 tons a month is no way be possible importing in bags. It had to be in bulk and it had, there had to be a terminal. And for you to be a terminal would take two years. So everybody, I mean the competitors, oh okay, let's see how they will do it. You know, it, cannot, it can never happen this and that. So one of the consultants said, you know, Alaji, there is a uh, an idea if you are ready. I said, tell me. He said, there is what is called a floating terminal. I said, what is a floating terminal? He said, okay. It's a terminal on a ship, on a vessel. It's a cement terminal that can do at that time 125,000 tons every month. It had its ship or loader, bagging plant, uh, the whole crew, accommodation for the whole crew. So it's, a, it's like a factory on a vessel, on a ship. But he said the only challenge is it is very expensive for you to buy this because it's a, it's a complete factory. But there are two available to, for sale in Greece, and these are the only two. And you know, uh, a company in, in India was actually looking to buy one. And you know, so I quickly said, we are interested. And he was like, oh, another company in Nigeria also is asking. 
I said, really, he said, yeah. I said, he said, he doesn't know the company, but it seems like they're already in cement, they're in Lagos, they're coming to inspect maybe next week in Greece. I said, when is the next flight to Greece? <laughs> the next day, we were in Greece. I mean, this is a true story, yeah? The next day, we were in Athens, we met with the owner of that vessel, we concluded that sale, we bought that vessel. We still have that vessel. The name of the vessel is Boa Cement One. If you Google it, you'll see it. <laughs> so we now came, bought the vessel. Of course, lo and behold, our competitor was in Greece the following week. And he said, we are sold, we are sold. We did, what? Who bought? He said, don't tell me I know. Boa, he said, yes. <laughs> he said, okay. So we now took the vessel, brought it to Lagos, you know, because the vessel, the, the factory is a vessel, you have to, it has to be moored at a time at a port. So meaning that you come, you bring the vessel, you keep it there, vessels will, boats men will come, discharge into that factory, from the factory you process and you back out. That's how the process is. So for you to be able to do that, you must have a permanent bath within the port. So we now come to Lagos. We brought in the vessel, one of the terminals, and of course the MDMPA the next day was there. What is this vessel doing here? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, because we are here now, let's discharge. Once we finish discharging, we'll go. No, 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 we cannot discharge here. Yeah? The vessel must go out. Of course, he had a call from our computer. So after every day we're having issues, so at the end of the day, Luckily for me, at that time, I had my Potaco terminal. Lagos was the biggest market where everybody, because you know, as we all know, Southwestern market is the biggest in terms of cement in Nigeria. So we wanted to be in Lagos, but then we were thrown out. I said, okay, no problem. I have my own terminal in Potaco. Let me just go there. So we now went to Potaco. We bathed Boas and Antoine there, and suddenly the business just picked up. And we were so pleasantly surprised that the market was even probably as big as Lagos because of the south, southeastern market. So we were doing so well. Then suddenly MPA again came. <laughs> Guys, you know, this is, even though it's a terminal, but it's for public use. Therefore, you are not allowed to keep this Boas one permanently. You can only keep it for one week in a month. I said, but MD, MPA, how can we have a terminal and we are not able. And I was like, look, anytime there is a vessel coming for anybody, I'm happy already to go out and allow them to come in. Once they go, I bring back, no, 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 a week, a month, max. I said, no, this cannot happen. So we kept fighting back and forth, you know. Of course, as the MDMPA, he could not, because he could not explain why a vessel must be out when there are no other vessels to come in. So I told him, anytime there's any vessel for anybody, I'm happy to accommodate them, to go out, to take my vessel out, let them come discharge. When they are done, they go. Then I can bring uh, Boaz and Antoine to continue. He was not happy with that. But we kept, we insisted, and there was nothing he could do. So they said that that wasn't working. So they now came up with another idea. <laughs> this idea is quite interesting. <laughs> Because the Boas meant one, as you know, since it is a factory, all the crew are foreign crew, right? Because you can't have Nigerian, because, so we had a crew of, I think, 28, all from Bangladesh. And the captain, you know, was uh, from uh, Greece. So one day I was in London, on Friday, I had just left mosque in London, I was going home, I had a call from Nigeria. Frantic calls, in fact, you know, because when I was praying, my phone was off. So when I finished praying, there were like maybe 10 missed calls from uh, my manager from Patakot. So I called him quickly. I was like, I knew that was a problem. The moment I saw that, I said, Alexi, we have an issue. Issue, what issue? He said, all our crew, they are now in the bus going to Lagos. They are, going, they are being deported. I said, deported? He said, yes, sir. I said, how? He said, they came with one-way tickets, <laughs> and they have taken everybody that they do not have their papers are not in order. Immigration. 
I say immigration from Portapes, you know, from Abuja. <laughs> I said, wow. On Friday at 3 o'clock. So I now made some few calls. I found out that the, uh, the, the DCG of immigration, one Dr. Brown, was senior brother to an employee of our competitor. So immediately I know where that was coming from. So I made a call to, I will mention his name because he really was there for us, he supported us. So I made a call to Alaji Tainimu, who was then the chief economic advisor to Mr. President. I explained everything to him. And he now quickly called the CG, Mr. Ude, at the time. And asked Mr. Ude, the CG immigration, are you aware that uh, some expatriates are being deported from Patakot? He checked, he said yes, he's checked. Yes, he understands that there is an issue of some people that uh, their documents are not in order, but the CG, the DCG handled it, and the people, because he actually thought that Tanimu wanted the people to go. Yes, so he was like, but now, sir, in the next one hour, they'll be airborne. <laughs> you know? He said, airborne, he said, okay, you know what? Stop that. He said, the plan has not left. He said, he has not left. But in one hour, you know, sir, I think in an hour's time, they'll be airborne, you know? So call them and stop them from going anywhere. He said, that thing that is done is illegal. He said, yeah. He said, yes, sir. So now, I was actually waiting. So by 5 p.m., my manager called me. He said, sir, because you followed them to Lagos today. They had already gone to Lagos when this was happening, around 5, 6. On the queue to enter Emirates to go to Dhaka, some country, some city in Bangladesh. So my manager then called around 5, 36. You know, Emirates was living at maybe 6, 6, 30. He said, ah, sir, something is happening. I said, eh. He said, there is one man running to go and bring our people back. <laughs> <laughs> so they were now returned. Went back to Patakot, we continued uh, with, our, with our operation. But then again, you know, the reason why I'm saying this is that it is so important that you always have to be on top of things because if you are in this kind of business, competition is always a big issue. Again, I want to use this opportunity. Our late president was always firm he wanted the right thing to be done because he intervened also. He called the uh, Tenimu, reported the matter to him. He called the minister then, Abe, you know, I think he was uh, a commandant here. You know, he was the minister interior at the time. And uh, the CG, Ude, and the chairman, MPA, Chief Aneni, late now. And the then MD of MPA, Wan Abdusalam from Kano. And he warned them that they must not allow, you know, competition to be using them against other businesses. So these are the issues that sometimes we go through in Nigeria and, uh, you know, in doing, uh, in doing business, you know. So, you know, it's funny because at the end of the day, we ended up, uh, building our own cement plants, you know, because of that. We made enough money to now start building Obu plant, which, you know, Admiral, you've visited, thank you so much, 2017. Is, uh, we are commissioning the third line now in, in Obu uh, of 3 million tons. So in total, we'll be having 9 million tons by the end of the, the year, God willing. We have Sokoto, which we are also commissioning the fifth line so combined, by the end of this year, we'll be looking at 17 million tons capacity from the time, you know, this all happened. And we have been able to do this because we've been focused. We have always been ensured that whatever money we make, we invest because it's so important. You know, we make so much money in this business, sometimes you get carried away. You want to go and buy a mansion in London or in South Africa or all these places and buy of course, you can use a little bit of that money to enjoy, but don't spend all of it, reinvest. Because at the end of the day, you know, you'll be able to, you know, to do more. You know, and uh, another way, another thing that I wanted to touch on is working, you know, with people.
partnerships, collaboration, networking, because no one can do it all alone. Having the right partners and relationship currency is very important as a strategic leader. Strategic leaders must also recognize the importance of collaboration and networking, both within the organizations and with external stakeholders, to leverage their collective expertise and resources. Strategic leaders should be good communicators, able to build strong relationships, find the right partners, seek out the right resources, and be open to feedback from others. Very, very important. You must be able to work with people. Because there is no way you can do everything by yourself. You can't do it all alone. So you need partners, you need you know, to have collaboration and partnerships. You know? So in Nigeria and African communities, the power of relationship and good youth currency can never be underestimated. I just you know, explained how we were supported, how we were helped because of that kind of relationship. It's a good way. You reach out, you greet people, you make sure that you keep in touch, you keep in contact. If anything happens, you can now easily go and maybe uh, reach out and you'll be supported. Always remember that you cannot do it all alone. And at various points, you will need people to help you out in driving your vision. What do I mean by this? If you are outsourcing, outsource to the best names, best companies, and the best talents, so that they can add the necessary value, even if it may, if, even if it may come at a premium. What I'm trying to say here is that if you are setting up a very big, gigantic factory company, for example, when we built our cement plant, our cement plant in Obu, uh, was our first biggest project. It was at the time a project worth over $450 million. And at the time, we decided, oh, we wanted to do it all alone. Meaning that we have, there were so many areas within the plant that we felt we could outsource and do ourselves. Because in the cement plant, we have the equipment, which quite a few companies were there providing. Then you have the utilities, you have the power plant, you have the construction, civils, you have the installation, you have the erection, you have the infrastructure, so many things. And we decided, okay, it's cheap, it will be cheaper for us Maybe let's try and get all these companies, different companies to come and do all of these aspects of the project. So we now contracted the company in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands to supply the equipment. This company, you know, called FLS, was and still, you know, one of the biggest companies in terms of the supply of equipment, you know, uh, to the cement industry. So we bought all the equipment from them. And then now we said, okay, we are going to get another company to come and erect. Another company to come and do the civils. So we employed JB Julius Bajak for the civil construction. We employed another company for the m and &E, for the automation, for the utilities, power plant. So at the end of the day, we ended up with 23 different contractors on site. It was chaotic. By the time we were done, and I can tell you that, you know, I can't count how many sleepless nights I had. You know, I was in Obu, in Opela, Admiral, you've been there. You know, I had slept with, you know, snakes, with all sorts of different things because I had to finish that project because we got to a point where, you know, it was getting very critical. Because we got it, I wouldn't say we got it wrong, but we thought we could do it all alone because we felt or we thought we could save money. So, you know, it was very, very challenging. We finished the project, but I tell you, at the end of the day, it cost us over a hundred million dollars more, took almost two years longer to finish, but thank God, 
We finished it. That was our first line. So when we now came for the second line, everybody was saying, mm, do we do? I said, no, guys, there's no way I'm going to go that route again. I have the experience, and thank God I've had the experience, I will not go through that route. Therefore, we have to do an EPC project now. So we went to a company, because at that time, even then, that company was there. We just thought that, oh, by doing it ourselves, we were going to be able to save money and do it faster. Start down with the company, negotiated the Chinese company, the came in to Nigeria, and within two years, they finished the second line, and production started. And I tell you, that line is working even better than the first one. And then we went ahead, you know, third line in Sokoto, fourth line in Sokoto, third line in Obu. So since then, we have done maybe seven lines. This will be the two lines that will be completed this year will be the seventh line. The Obu one will be the third, and Sokoto will be the fourth. So they would have built six lines for us because we only built uh, we only built that, that first one. Again, this has now that experience has now helped to make me understand the idea of actually working with partners in collaboration with others. Because what is happening today now is that we have a refinery and a pet care that we're building in Akwa Ibom State. When we started discussing on that project, Everybody was of the opinion that, oh, maybe we should, you know, try and divide the project into different packages and try and get companies locally to do this, get the equipment to, similar to what we did with our first line of cement. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going down to them because not only do we have a, did we have a bad experience then when we were building cement, but we also know what is happening with the largest refinery in Nigeria being built. So we have the experience. We know it. Everybody has seen it. A refinery project that is taking over 10 years to build, cost more than double what it should have cost, and still unfinished. I said no. So we now decided that, okay, it's not a problem. Let's look at everything. So we now got companies. We divided the project into three to four packages. Because the project is so big that you cannot give it to just one company to do, to do it as one EPC project. So we said, okay, let's try and divide it into packages. So we did, we divided it into five packages only. ISBL, for example, which is the inside battery limit for the project, which you have your process you need, you know, all the heart of the project, one EPC contractor. OSBL, outside battery limit which includes all their civils, their buildings, you know, cabling and what have you. JT, marine, and then we have the power, because it's huge. It's about 350 megawatts of power, one EPC contractor. And then you have your, your utilities, which will be the flare, the water treatment plants, you know, the oxygen, the nitrogen, all the utilities. So with that, now we've got companies that will come, they will give you guarantees, Fixed costs, they start, they finish. And this is what we are doing. Because it took us a bit of time, you know, to actually have from pre-feed to feed to the detailed design and engineering and then sourcing the right companies that will come and do this. If you look at the Lekki Refinery, there are about maybe 80 different contractors. So we have seen that experience and we realize again, yes, what we have said and what we have decided to do is the best option for us to be able to, because the worst thing is for you to start a project and you don't have enough money to finish it. That would be the worst. That is the worst thing ever. And any project that takes longer than necessary to complete is going to be a disaster. So imagine having to borrow money and you are building for 10 years and that project is not completed and you pay interest in dollars maybe six, seven, eight hundred million dollars every year. I mean, 
you would need government to bail you out, and you don't want that. So that is why, again, as I said, um, it is important to, 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 to think through whatever you are doing, to get partners and to collaborate with others to ensure that you get it done. Because if you try to do it all alone, eventually it's going to be more expensive, it will take longer, and you may end up going bankrupt. Okay, so again, uh, for me, I think there are so many experiences that you know I can discuss here, but I know we are probably uh, time is probably against us because I know there are going to be other interruptions. So inclusion and diversity. Again, your employees are your greatest assets. Never cut corners with getting the right talent. Inclusion and diversity are essential components of strategic leadership as they enable organizations to leverage the full potential of their employees and stakeholders. Strategic leaders should give priority to building a diverse and inclusive workplace where people feel valued and empowered to contribute their best. Continuous learning and development. The Japanese Kaizen philosophy. I don't know, I'm sure some of, some of you must have heard of the Jap Japanese concept called Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese word that translates to continuous improvement. It is a philosophy and methodology that emphasizes the importance of continuously making small incremental improvements to processes, systems, and practices. When applied to strategic leadership, Kaizen can help leaders create a culture of continuous improvement and ensure that their organizations are always adopting to changing circumstances. To do this well, strategic leaders must be committed to continuous learning and development, both personal, personally and for their organizations, to ensure they remain at the forefront of innovation and growth. This includes encouraging a culture of experimentation, learning from failures, and providing opportunities for employee development. As a leader, it is important to model the behavior you want to see in your team. Encourage a culture of continuous improvement by consistently seeking out feedback, experimenting with new ideas, and celebrating small wins along the way, no matter how small. Celebrate it. Even if it is your houseboy or office boy, he brings you tea. Say thank you, encourage them. You are a houseboy, you are a driver. He has a baby. Congratulate him. These little, little things matter to people. Always. So you must always appreciate and celebrate your people, your workers. It is so, so, so important. I have a, a house a office boy. He's a small boy, you know, from Benue State. And he serves me tea in my office. You know, so somebody told me, I was actually calling him. I said they should call uh, John. And the person I asked to call John said, oh, pastor. And I was, oh, is he a pastor? He said, ah, yes, he's a pastor. I said, oh, okay, that's good. So when he came, I said he should give me tea. When he was going, ah, I said, thank you so much, pastor. If you see his face, the smile, just because I called him pastor. <laughs> I'm telling you. He said, sir, how do you know? I said, it's good now. He said, thank you, sir. And he was so happy because I'm celebrating the fact that he's a pastor. So these are the little, little things that matter. So always appreciate and celebrate your people. Whenever you are, you know, doing anything, always carry your employees, your staff along. Let them be a part and parcel of what you do. Let them feel like they are, you are a family. It's very important. That sense of belonging matters so much. It's always important. Don't regard them as just 
you know, a number. No. Regard them as, you know, like they are your family. You will be able to achieve a lot more with them. They will be able to do a lot more. They will care a lot more and they will add value a, more, a lot more to whatever they are doing within the organization. I've learned that a long time ago. Finally, as a strategic leader, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you do not sit down, reflect on how much you've succeeded, and think maybe on how to, to give back. Giving back is so important because whatever we do, at the end of the day, a friend of mine was telling me, try and also see how you can support others. You know, you see, this works. You can only wear one. If you wear another one, you other and they think you're mad. Cap, you can't wear one on top. <laughs> so everything that you need, you have. You know, you should thank God. So I decided a long time ago, actually, that we have to find a way, you know, to support our people, because we have been supported by the people of this country, and I decided to set up a structured way of giving back to the society, and Africa, of course. So two years ago, I decided to set up this annual $100 million Africa Fund for Sustainable Development and Renewal under my foundation the Abdul Samad Radio Africa Initiative. So to me, I think it is very important because the joy in succeeding or success is to be able to give back to society. There's nothing that gives me more joy than being able to give back, always. Because whenever you see somebody that is in need and you support or you help him, that joy is more than you wake up and you make so much money in your business or profit. At the end of the day, I think it is very important we need to continue to support, we need to continue to do more because there are so many people out there that need our support. And God has blessed us. Nigeria has done so much. They supported us quite a lot. We are making it and I think we should continue to support. So I want to use this opportunity once again to thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm happy to answer questions or comments. Thank you.